I was when you got through all your training and you got to your squadron. Can you talk about the first like phone call you got for a real mission? Like, oh shit, this is real. Like, this is like it now. Um. Yeah, so probably the first one that I did of any significance. Um, there were a couple of little ones, but uh, the the big one was 1989, uh, the rescue of Kurt Muse from Modelo Prison. Um, now I can talk about that because it has been declassified. Um, there's actually a couple of uh, Discovery Channel, um, you know, documentaries on it, and uh, which was funny because some of my teammates were actually on that. I never knew that even happened. I was like, hey, I, that's my teammates <laughs> talking about this <laughs> thing, right? But uh, uh, that was uh, – so what happened was on that particular one, this was 1989. I had just graduated the Q course. Um, literally just got home, back to, to the unit. The first day on the – back to training, I got fragmented by um, – actually, I got fragmented by a, a, a stun grenade. And uh, so now I'm basically crippled. I got, you know, some on crutches. And I got relegated to staff duty, um, you know, until I could heal. So the first or second night I was on duty – uh, I got a phone call from uh, Jay Sock on the red phone and said, basically, they said, you know, um, you know, alert your unit, the, you know, the operations in effect, right? He's using all the code words and stuff. So mm-hmm. and I knew it was real because the reason I got injured was we were training up for this thing. We knew this mm-hmm. was going to come and we were training up for it when I got injured on the first damn day. Um, and so it's, it's not looking like I'm going to go anywhere. I get the call. I alert the unit, hit the pagers. Everybody starts coming in. It just happened that my um, my squadron, my platoon, was on alert at the time, and uh, my troop commander, who's now you know General Harrelson um, at the time, was uh, a Major Harrelson, came into my office, in staff duty office, and uh, I remember he walked in. He goes, "Listen, man, this is it. This is the Super Bowl." He goes, "This is what we've all been training for." He goes, "I know you're injured, you know, and I know you're going through a bad divorce right now, which I was. You know, I had all kinds of drama going on at home." Mm-hmm. And he goes, but I wouldn't, uh, he goes, I wouldn't feel right if I didn't even at least ask you if you wanted to go along, right? And uh, I thought about it for about two seconds. I realized, you know what? Yeah, why am I going to let a, a crazy wife, you know, that I'm going to get divorced from stop me from doing what I want to do in my job? And why would I let an injured leg stop me? And I literally said, I'm on the way. I pulled my suit off and put my flight suit on and started packing my shit. Within a couple hours, we were wheels up going down range. Um, and that's... We got there, I think it was December 17th or 18th, something like that, when we got there. And uh, H hour was uh, basically 0020 on December 20th um, at Modelo Prison. So what we had to do was we're going to rescue Kurt Muse, who was locked up in the Modelo Prison, which means model prison. And um, and then right across the street was the Commandancia at Noriega's headquarters. So we knew that the whole area was just inundated with uh, Panamanian Defense Force troops. They were living in all the high-rise apartments there. Um, you know, we had Dignitary Battalion, the militia all over the street. And uh, so this was the hornet's nest. And uh, so we knew what the situation, the enemy situation looked like. Um, our mission was to, to get inside of Modelo Prison and rescue Kurt Muse. That was the initial goal. And, uh, and that was what we were tasked to do. And it just so happens that I was the breacher tasked with breaching the prison. And uh, and honestly, the first time I ever saw the objective was when I was on the objective uh, because I was in school the whole time. So I never got to rehearse on the mock-ups <laughs> or the training or anything. It was like I showed up, here's your door, build a charge for it, and let's go. And, uh, and so I did. And what happened was, what's kind of interesting is I got um, intel from the agency, CIA, and they told us that there's an annex on the third floor on the roof. You know, it's about a 10 by 10 annex with a door on it. Um, it was a roof access uh, into the building. And uh, they said, oh, there was a, there's going to be a heavy-duty steel door. That's that's it, right? And so that's what I based my charges on. And then I'm sitting there as I was building the charge. I started thinking about it. I was like, you know, there's not going to be any good guys on the other side of that door. And I really got to get in that door. I said, let me just add a little bit more explosive. <laughs> so I, 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 I used the P factor, right? P for plenty. <laughs> so I there stacked a whole bunch on it, right? I made a pretty, I, I built a nuclear weapon is what I did. Um, but there was no way we're not going to get into this thing. And I'm glad I did it because that night we, when we did the infill and we landed on the roof, um, I ran up to the door and lo and behold, to my shock and surprise, yeah, there was a steel door, all right. But six inches in front of the steel door was a jail door, heavy duty mm. jail door. And so from, if you think about it from an ex- explosives perspective, um, 
I only have a little bit of surface area, the bars yeah. to place my charges, right? And uh, so I'm gonna lose a lot of energy um, because of that. But because I use the P factor, I had a lot of extra ass on that charge, right? There you go. <laughs> and so I actually blew that that steel door through that solid uh, metal door. To, and it basically sent them like two flying plates across the, to the annex down on the other side. And they kind of nicely slid down the wall and just kind of was stacked out of the way. It was, couldn't, I couldn't have done it any better, right? That's crazy. Cool. <laughs> that had to have been a ton of explosives to knock down two steel doors. Yeah, yeah. I turned into a, a, a concrete uh, annex. So um, it was several pounds. I'll just put it that way, okay? Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, it was several pounds. How did the entry go after the after the breach? How was everything? <laughs> So I, it, it wasn't without its drama, right? So what actually happened was, so I placed the charge. Um, we had, on the bottom of the charge, we have our dead cord, it's the tail that comes off. And normally you keep your firing system separated from the explosives until you're ready to uh, initiate, then you put them together. Well, for some reason I had a little bit extra longer tail than I needed. And then the firing system had a long tail on it. So, so by the time I coupled these two of these together, I had about a 12 inch, 12 to 18 inch tail that I really didn't need. And so that extra uh, charge with the fuse igniters, um, as I was moving away, grabbed my damn boot, right? Oh. And and I could see the charge falling off the door behind me. <laughs> and I only had uh, an eight second fuse on it, eight seconds. Oh my and, God. Yeah, and think about that. So I've already wasted two seconds trying to stand up and move away when that charge starts falling off. And it literally falls out on the roof in front of the whole breaching, the whole team. Oh, and, wow. uh and I turn around, I look, and I see it. And I remember uh, at the time, the troop commander, because he was out in the front, he yells at my team leader, you know, Steve, fix it, fix it, right? And I remember standing there thinking, well, what's Steve going to do? He's not the breacher. I'm the breacher, right? He was my team leader. And uh, in my head, I'm already counting 1,000, 2,000, 3,000. I realized, okay, for whatever reason, that thing's not going to go off. And uh, so I run back out there and hail of bullets. I pick it up. I run back up to the door. I stick it under nice and firm again. And I go through, but by the numbers, I say, okay, you know, each firing system one by one um, until it fires. And actually what happened was uh, I had actually a malfunction um, and it had to do with electric tape. There's, there's a reason why it malfunctioned, but because I went through it and I did it, um, an individual manipulation of each firing system, um, I got one to fire and uh, I knew when it went and it's burning and, and boom, the charge goes. After the charge went, the entry was smooth. Um, every, you know, we had a couple teams went in, including mine and uh, it flowed nicely all the way through the building until we got to, uh, Kurt Muse. And so, uh, there was a little bit of a firefight down, uh, with the rescue of Kurt, uh, with his interrogator, but uh, we didn't, we managed to prevail uh, and then get Kurt out of the building, get him into one of the little birds and get him off the roof, which then his bird gets shot down. hits the street and there's another firefight going on. So, so oh, it wasn't man. without incidents along the way. Um, uh, and I still remember I was laying on the second floor um, because the teams had lined up and it's pitch black. And it's a raging firefight at this point. We're taking fire from all the, the you know, the departments down onto us, the commandants. I mean, it, just, it was just a, a hornet's nest. And I'm laying on a on the floor on the balcony engaged with targets inside the prison area, which they had actually reinforced with the soldiers because they were expecting a, a ground assault on that prison. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, and I'm waiting. I can hear the helicopters landing, and and I'm waiting for somebody to give me the signal. And I tap my leg or something. Let's go. And I never got it. And after a while, it got really strange and quiet down there, even though I'm shooting and stuff. And I started reaching back with my my non-firing hand, and I couldn't feel my teammate. I sweep around my legs trying to feel somebody. And I, I, it occurred to me, I'm in the building by myself. <laughs> Everybody left the house. And oh so, fuck. Um, and then the next thing I heard was the Panamanian Defense Forces were working their way up the stairs. Uh, I could hear him talking. I could hear him stepping on cr crushed glass and things like that. And I thought, holy shit, I'm in this building, in this prison by myself. And the unit had left. They forgot about him because they didn't see me. I'm laying down. It's pitch black. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I just pick up and run like hell up the freaking stairs. And uh, and I run outside the annex. And thank goodness, um, the helicopter, my helicopter was still there. And when I got to the, the bird, um, we, you know, we find the little AH sixes, um, or MH sixes with the people pods, you know, the, the bench where two guys can sit on the outside. And, uh, there was somebody sitting in my seat and I'm like, Hey, Hey, hey. you know, we're, we're trying to figure this thing out. I was like, where's your helicopter? Right. Suddenly we don't have enough room to get everybody off the roof. And, uh, and then I guess the guy who was in my seat realized he got on the wrong helicopter. He got up and gave me my seat and we flew away. Um, 
And then we got back to Howard Air Force Base and we had a total of, I think, 15 helicopters, a um, couple of C2 Blackhawks. We had four H6s, four uh, Apaches, four MH6s, um, but it was a total package of, I think, 15 helicopters. And we were going to be the last ones back. My bird would be the last one back at Howard Air Force Base in front of what they call the JMAL, which is a joint, the, the medical uh, unit there, right? Mm -hmm. So we land, and we're the only helicopter that lands. And all the doctors and nurses are standing with arms crossed, like, wait. And we're like, something ain't right. We're not supposed to be here first. We're supposed to be here last. Where's everybody else at? And my team leader is like, okay, hold on. He runs over there, and he's talking to somebody, comes back. And then he said, okay, guys, lock and load. Uh, we got to go back in. He goes, the aircraft with the uh, precious cargo on it was shot down. And he was. As soon as they lifted off the roof, um, they took a lot of ground fire and hit them in the ass end, and uh, they flew down some alleys, hit some power lines, and then, and then stoved into uh, into into a side street. And uh, what was going through your that, mind? What was going through your mind when you heard that? Like, hey, we got to go back because the helo went down. Dude, that's when I got scared. I wasn't scared up to that point because up to that point, I mean, literally, it was just a free for all. You know, mm -hmm. uh, literally from the roof, actually shooting off the helicopter, people shooting at us. But it felt like training because we always train like it's live fire and it's for real, right? We always use live ammunition. So it didn't feel any different from any our training scenarios. So I was quite comfortable at it. The only thing that was a little off was the the, the uh, 197th Infantry was actually um, blocking the intersections with their uh, M113 APCs. And all the, the guys that manned those vehicles were literally like clerks and, and cooks and stuff because the infantry guys had gone home for Christmas vacation. Oh. So they're so they're manning everything, and they're just literally shooting at anything that moves. And so we're flying off the roof, and I all I can see is these big flaming basketballs, which were 50 caliber tracers, flying up underneath my feet, underneath the helicopter, right? And uh, I mean, it, you ever see a 50 caliber flaming, uh, uh, um, you know, um, tracer, tracer coming around. at you? It looks like a flaming base, a basketball is <laughs> getting bigger and bigger, and whoosh, you know. And so after we landed, we told <clears throat> we were told we we're going to go back in. That's when I got a little bit nervous because I realized, you know, I had time to think about what just happened. And like, oh, shit, we're going to go back in there. You know, it's really a free for all right now. And so we locked and loaded and started spinning up again. And then the next helicopter starts coming in. The next one starts coming in. And then we got the call to stand down that they actually recovered, um, you know, Kurt Muse and the team that was on that bird. Some of them had been shot. Um, some of them had uh, severed some of their, you know, toes off their feet from when the helicopter landed mm -hmm. on the skid, landed on the toes things like that. Uh, but they managed to, to uh, recover everybody. And uh, so the mission, you know, although it was a little bumpy, it was, it was a huge success at the end of the day. Um, we didn't take any casualties. Um, the force was about 25 uh, people total. Um, took no casualties. We had a lot of uh, injuries. In fact, the little birds that, that flew us in, um, you know, they had weight limitations and we had to put two operators, or four operators on each bird. And, so we ended up stripping out all the avionics that they didn't need to lighten mm -hmm. the load. And two of our four uh, uh, MH birds, people carriers, um, had only one pilot just to trim weight. We had to weigh ourselves. I was the lightest guy with 70 pounds worth of gear, and I didn't even have water on me. Uh, I'm just carrying explosives and weapons and ammunition and, uh, and body armor. And I was 70 pounds. I was the lightest guy. And so the two birds that had two pilots, each one of their pilots got shot. So, oh, you know, imagine that, right? Talk about luck again, you know? For sure. But, um, yeah, you know, after like, you said that was your first, like, kind of real mission that you got called up on, you know, when when you have something like that where you got, you're coming back with dudes are getting injured, helicopters are getting shot down, like, this is real life stuff. This is like, you know, that's craziness, right? Yeah. How many guys like you go out on that first mission? And then, but then they come back and they're like, dude, you know what? This isn't for me. Like that was, that was too much, you know, like the realness yeah. of it.